Hello everyone! Welcome back to Reading with Raptors on another beautiful Tuesday late morning here in the Twin Cities, the St. Paul campus of the U of M. Um, I'm Kelsey and I am joined today by an American Kestrel that we call Darner. Uh, we call her that after the Darner Dragonfly, a very large dragonfly that normally is living here in kind of the northern part of North America and who is right now migrating. And so these migrating dragonflies are very quickly followed by migrating American kestrels who will follow them all the way down to the southern U.S., Gulf of Mexico, Central America kind of area. So that is why she has the name Darner. So today, I thought since I've been talking a lot about migration all during September, now that we're into October, I was kind of realizing that I didn't really give a lot of good resources on really how to go out and do some of this bird watching. And there's still plenty of bird watching to be done. I know I was out this weekend and there should still be plenty of fantastic weather. And for anyone watching a little bit further south where migration season is still definitely in full swing, this might be a little bit helpful. So I actually found a book about how to bird watch for those of us who have not been able to get out and do something like that before. So I thought that that might be kind of fun to read and be able to talk about. Uh, we are currently outside here since at least here in the Twin Cities it is gorgeous out. It's some kind of last nice bright summery kind of fall weather. So we've got the building where we house all of our education birds is right behind us. So we might be hearing some noises from all of the birds there. I know I was hearing one of the Merlins earlier. We normally hear a little bit from at least one of the barred owls, maybe some of the great horned owls or bald eagles. So we might be hearing some ambient noises there along with the other kind of U of M campus noises. So I'll, I'll pause if there's anything really loud or especially exciting that I want to point out, but there will be some kind of background noises as we, as we hang out here. She also has a full mouse that she's holding in her feet, so some of the kind of leaning over kind of behavior that she's doing, some of it might be eating, but she might also be doing a little bit to kind of make sure that no one's trying to steal that mouse, including me. I know I don't want it, but she doesn't quite know that. So she might be doing what we call mantling or kind of leaning over that food to hide it a little bit better. So hopefully she'll work on that as we get started. So today I found a book just called Bird Watching. And this is by Margaret Carney, and it's part of the um, kind of DK collection of books, Discover Knowledge. So this one has a lot of great information on how to actually go out and bird watch and some helpful hints. I know pretty much every week I talk about the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, and I'm sure I'll bring them up again with the All About Birds website, but this has some great tips on some other ways to kind of figure out what birds you're looking at. So this is the first page. This one has a lot of uh, actual photographs in it, bird watching. So this says, why watch birds? Why even do that? Have you ever seen a hawk dive like a speeding arrow? Have you watched ducks marching in a line? Have you observed a pair of birds busily building a nest? If so, you know why bird watching is so popular. Bird watchers can learn a great deal about birds by studying them in their habitats. By looking and listening, they learn to identify birds by their appearance, behavior, and songs. Bird watchers also help scientists by gathering and sharing their information. If you would like to become a bird watcher, this book can get you started. Here are a few facts kind of around the edges. It says hummingbirds can fly backwards. The kookaburra often sounds like a person laughing. And some swans live to be 70 years old. All things that we can kind of learn and see by watching and observing these birds in their natural habitats. So here it says finding birds. Where do we find them? You can find birds in all kinds of habitats, ranging from open areas to crowded cities. Birds usually live in fields, deserts, high grasses, trees, bushes, parks, and near water. You can find the birds in your area with the help of a field guide. A field guide tells you what species of birds live, you, live near you, what types of habitats they live in, and what time of year the birds are in your area. So here are some different birds you can find around the world. Here we have a Eurasian jay feeding in the woods in Scotland. Here we have pigeons in the city in Croatia. We have geese in a pond in Canada and then a rosella in the grasslands in Australia. Lots of different birds all around the world. 
lots of different kinds of birds. So here it says some materials that they recommend are having a field guide, either a book field guide or maybe an online field guide, a notebook, and a pencil or a pen. Step one, borrow a field guide from a library or a friend or buy one at a bookstore. Some field guides cover only one region or country, so make sure you find your field guide. So make sure your field guide includes your area. Look for the range maps in your field guide. In some guides, they are all located in one section. In other guides, there is a range map next to each bird. Here's what these range maps look like, where it's a big map. So this one's kind of particular to our North American friends. So apologies if anyone's watching from elsewhere. But we have kind of the area here in North America where we have Canada, the US, and then we also have Mexico, part of Central America. And you can see where it says that there are yellow markings for the summer months. So you can see that this bird normally lives up in Canada in the northern US and along the coasts during the summer. Here there's a color that's this kind of reddish orange for all year round. So there's some areas here in the southern US where a bird might live all year round. And then the green usually means where a bird might live. Uh, you might not be able to find the bird or it might mean something else. On this map it looks like it means that so you don't see the bird there. Maybe they head down into South America for the winter. So usually you'll see a color code and a little key that tells you where to find the bird at what time of year. So, oh, this map, range map shows where the osprey lives in North America. So kind of near the coast, that makes sense. So step three, choose a bird that lives in your country and find the range map for that bird. If your location is shaded or colored, the bird may live in or around your area. So a comment on the range maps too, migration. Some birds migrate from place to place. Others live in the same area all year. If a bird migrates, the range map may be shaded with two colors or patterns. Use the map key to find out what time of year each color or pattern represents. So that's what I was saying with our range map here. So you can use that to figure out, for example, where you might find an osprey at what time of year. Here's some more steps for figuring out how to find these birds. Make a list of other birds that you would like to find that are in your area during this time of year. So what other birds can you find during the fall? Add these birds habitats such as trees, shrubs, fields, ponds, and beaches to your list. So here we have somebody looking through a field guide and finding what other birds live in their area. Thinking about finding osprey. Choose one or two habitats near your home where you can look for these birds. And review the pictures of the birds that live in your area. This will help you identify the birds when you look for them. So here's a picture of a black crowned night heron. So maybe you live in an area where there's lots of water and you might go, oh, I'm looking for osprey already, but I found that there are black crowned night herons that also live in areas with water near me at this time of year. So I'm gonna remember what they look like so I can try to find them while I'm out looking for osprey. Here are some tips for finding birds. Always move slowly and quietly so that you do not scare the birds. Listen carefully for sounds such as bird songs or calls that could lead you to birds. Birds that are feeding may tap on trees, rustle leaves, or splash in water. It's a commentary on making some sounds. I'm gonna skip that one. So here are some tips on using binoculars. If you have a pair of binoculars at home that maybe you've not used before, or you get a chance to find some, here's some tips on using some binoculars. One of the most important tools for bird watchers is binoculars. Binoculars magnify far away objects by making them look closer and larger. They will allow you to view birds' natural behavior at a distance without disturbing them. Before you go bird watching, it's important to become comfortable using your binoculars. So you can choose a pair of binoculars and read the instruction booklet if you have one. It will explain the important features. Try finding an object to observe that is about 30 feet away or farther. Sit or stand in a comfortable, steady position and hold the binoculars up to your eyes, like this person is doing here. You hold them right up to your eyes. 
adjust the main image control until the image is clear. If it's still blurry, you might need to adjust the control on one of the eye pieces, usually the one on the right. You can practice this all a few times using different objects, so then when you're comfortable using your binoculars, you're ready to find birds. So usually binoculars have a couple different pieces on them. There's kind of a main way to adjust them. There's eye pieces. And then here are kind of the different ways that you can, you can use them. So you might see if you don't adjust them, they're really blurry. But if you do, you get a really clear image. So you can see the bird like, if you were in the right area, you could see a Eurasian goldfinch, really crystal clear. Or that big, there's actually a darner dragonfly zooming around us right now. If it lands over closer to here, I'll try to see if we can look at it. Right now it's sitting on the sidewalk in the sun. Hopefully it comes over here and we can actually get a closer look at it. So now that you have figured out how you're going to actually watch birds, what else do you need? Getting ready to go bird watching. Before you go outside to look for birds, be prepared. Make sure that you wear the right kind of clothes, you take all the necessary supplies, and you always tell an adult where you are going. If your bird watching is going to take you out of your neighborhood, ask an adult to go with you. Some things that you might want, some clothes and shoes for outdoors, especially now in the fall when the weather can be a little unpredictable. You might want a field guide if you have binoculars, but also bring a notebook and colored pencils or pens. Wear clothes that are kind of a dull tan, brown, green, or gray. Bright colored clothes may scare birds. Avoid wearing clothes that make a noise as you move. Birds are usually shy and are easily frightened away by unusual sounds. Choose shoes that are comfortable and suitable for the place you will be walking. You may need hiking boots or waterproof shoes. So here we have somebody who's wearing nice long pants for going in through bushes and other kind of natural areas where there might be burrs or poison ivy or things like that that you don't want to get on you. Nice dark colors, kind of earthy colors for blending in a little bit better. If we can learn anything from owls or birds like American kestrels, it is that camouflage is very important. If needed, take a hat with a brim to keep the sun out of your eyes so that you can see the birds clearly. Wear sunscreen and take insect repellent with you if you are bird watching during warm months. Definitely want to keep ourselves safe. Bring a notebook and colored pencils or pens so you can keep a bird journal to talk about next. And make sure you have a field guide and if you have binoculars with you. Again, field guides can be books or there are lots of really great free ones online. And also make sure to pack some water and a snack. If you plan to spend the day hiking, take a lunch. Now you are ready for bird watching. Our American kestrel here started to eat the mouse, it looks like. We'll see if she continues. Here are some tips for actually watching birds. When you go bird watching, you should take a bird journal. A bird journal is a notebook where you write about the birds that you see. This will help you remember them and better understand their habits. Here are some ideas for how to keep a bird journal while you are bird watching. So it says you just need a notebook or really just any paper and some colored pencils or pens. Write down the date, time, and location where you first see each bird. Also, make a note about what the weather is like. Was it raining? Was it sunny? Was it really windy out? Use your binoculars to study the bird up close. Remember that you can use the controls to help you focus on your bird. Write about what you see. Describe the bird's appearance, such as its size, color, beak shape, wings, or the kind of feet that it has. If you do not recognize the bird, compare it with the bird that you know. For example, is it bigger than a robin? Is, it, is, it, <laughs> is its beak hooked like a hawk's or pointed like a sparrow's? You can also make a sketch of the bird. Draw any special field markings or color and feather patterns that you see on the bird. So here's an example of what a bird journal could look like. This one says, Saturday, August 10th at 1.30 p.m. It was a sunny day today and I went to look for birds in my grandma's garden. I put some food on the bird table and then I waited for some birds to come down. I saw a small bird. 
It had brown and spotted feathers and a pointed beak. And here's a little drawing of a small bird. So using the notes written down here and the drawing here, some of the parts labeled, we're able to figure out that it looks like this person saw a thrush, a kind of small bird, very similar to a robin that some of us might be more familiar with. So being able to keep those notes can be really helpful for figuring out what a bird is later. You can also write down how the bird moves. When it flies, does it glide or flap its wings? Does it travel in a flock with a partner or alone? Does it walk, hop, or climb? Here are some pigeons in flight. So you can describe how the pigeons are flying. Describe any other activities or behaviors that you observe. For example, is the bird eating seeds or insects? Is it preening its feathers? Listen for any songs or calls made by the bird. Each species has its own. For example, are the bird's calls raspy or are they clear and whistling? Describe these sounds in your journal. And then you can use your journal and a field guide to identify the species of each bird that you see. The next activity will show us how, so we'll keep reading and find out more. But here you can see some different behaviors that you might see birds doing. Here's something called an azure kingfisher that was feeding. So it has a big fish in its beak. That would be something very interesting to write down. Here are some macaws preening. So maybe you see birds interacting with each other in a big flock and preening each other or socializing. And here we have a white crowned sparrow singing. So maybe you're seeing them making noise and writing down what those noises sound like. That might be very helpful for figuring out what a bird is or what kind of bird it is, I guess. <laughs> maybe a better way to say that. So identifying birds. This is where things uh, can be a little tricky, so let's find out more. Once you have finished writing information in your journal, it's time to identify the birds that you saw. You may want to follow these steps while you are still out in the field. You may also compare your bird journal notes to the field guide when you return home. So here is a picture of a Eurasian robin. So this is a kind of small robin that we don't have here in North America, but maybe if we have any friends in Eurasia and Europe and kind of Northern Asia, you might see these birds, but they're a great example of all the different parts of a bird. So we have the beak or sometimes called the bill. Above that, a lot of times people call the top of a bird's head, the crown. So the feathers on top of their head is called the crown. Might also call right underneath their beak, the chin. So if they have special markings on their chin, here, of course, is their eye. Sometimes there are a ring of feathers that are a different color around the eye that we call an eye ring. So sometimes that's very helpful. Underneath the eye and the chin, we have the throat. So you might see some different colors on the throat of the bird. Here is what we call the breast or the chest of the bird. So the kind of round kind of tummy area on the bird that you might see some brightly colored feathers on. Underneath that we have the belly, so the kind of low area next to the legs where you might see some different colored feathers. Above all of that we have the side of the bird. You can see on this bird the breast or the chest of the bird is this orange color. The belly is kind of white and then the side is kind of gray, almost brown, kind of a gray brown. So we also have here on the back of the bird we have the back. <laughs> Not very creative with the name for that. So we have the back of the bird. On this one, it's brown. And then we also have the wing here. So we have a nice brown wing on this bird. We also have at the top of the tail, kind of here at the top of the tail of the bird, we have what we call the rump, kind of the rear end of the bird. And then at the end of that, we have, of course, the tail. So you can see the brown tail on this bird. Then you also have the leg of the bird, which might look different depending on the species. And then of course the foot. So all of these are parts of a bird that you might want to identify. You might want to write down what color they are, if they were shiny or not, if they were moving them around. All of these might be very important notes for figuring out what kind of bird this is. So this one we can see again is a Eurasian robin, which we do not have here in North America, but is very common in a lot of parts of the world. So how else can we identify birds? 
still holding on to the mouse over here with our American Kestrel. So, step number one. Find the picture in the field guide that looks most like the bird that you saw. I will say, as a note, um, there are some online field guides or um, websites or uh, phone apps that you can use on a phone or a tablet or something like that, where you can actually go in and select some things like the size of the bird and the color of the bird and where you were at and what you saw the bird doing. If it was sitting uh, out on the water or if it was at a feeder or if it was sitting up in a tree and then it will narrow down the list for you. So instead of having to flip through a whole book or scroll through a bunch of pictures, it can help narrow it down by going, hmm, if this bird was sitting out in the water or if this bird was sitting out in the tree and it was brown and it was in October in St. Paul, it's a little bit easier to figure out what kind of bird that might be. So sometimes those online field guides are really helpful for this. Moving on. You can compare the picture and the bird's description to your journal notes and what you remember about the bird. If you are unsure what part of a bird the guide is referring to, check the labels on the bird diagram that we'll see that we just talked about. Or usually if you have an actual book field guide, there are guides there to help you remember. So here we're comparing this sparrow, this house sparrow. So here the note says in this tiny little drawn notebook version of a journal, it says, I saw four small birds in the park today. They all looked the same. They had brown and gray feathers and some had white stripes on their wings. They all had short, sharp beaks. So by looking at a field guide and comparing notes, they were able to figure out that this was a sparrow, kind of common sparrow. This looks like a house sparrow. Here are a few notes about bird beaks that might also help you out. You can identify birds by the shape of their beaks. The beak's shape can tell you what type of food the bird eats and how it gets its food. So here are some examples. A short pointed beak helps the silvered ear messia crack open small seeds. So a lot of our finches and sparrows will have really short pointed beaks like this one that help them break open seeds. So a lot of our small seed eating birds have beaks that look like this. Hopefully we're all pretty familiar with these by now. A sharp hooked beak helps the golden eagle tear meat. So raptors like eagles and our falcon here and owls and osprey and vultures, they have a hooked beak for tearing their food into pieces. A long thin beak helps the gray breasted spider hunter snatch spiders from their webs. So this bird has a very special long beak for snapping up insects and other bugs, I guess I should say. And a wide flat beak helps the white duck strain small animals, plants, and seeds from the water. So we have a very long pointy beak. And then we have this wide flat beak for this duck who's doing that dabbling or kind of sifting through the surface of the water. So those beak shapes can be really important. You can also, when you're trying to identify a bird, check the range map to see if that bird ever appears in your area. If it doesn't, you are probably looking at a bird that is similar to the one in your field guide, but is actually a different bird. So maybe you look at a picture of, we have something flying overhead that we're watching. So sometimes you'll find a picture of a bird and you look at it and you go, oh, that looks just like what I saw. But then you'll look at the range map and sometimes this happens to me. I'll see a bird that looks really familiar and then I'll look at the range map and find that it only lives somewhere like Florida and it's never seen in Minnesota. So the odds are pretty low that what I saw was the bird that I thought I saw. So I have to keep on looking to figure out what bird might look similar, but it actually is found here in Minnesota. So those range maps are very helpful. Check in the field guide for the time of year or the season when the bird is found in your area. Does the bird live in your area all the time or only during one season? See if the information matches when you saw the bird. Then you can write the name of the bird in your journal. Soon you'll know birds common to your neighborhood. Don't worry if you can't identify every bird. Even experts can become confused. Trying to identify birds is just part of the fun of bird watching. So here are some notes about unidentified birds. <laughs> if you're not sure of the identity of your bird, check your notes carefully. Could the bird be a juvenile? Juvenile or young birds 
have different plumage or feathers than adult birds. Some birds' plumage changes in winter too. Also, don't forget that in some species, the males and females look different. So here are, uh, here are some pictures of a bird that are all the same kind of bird called a green finch, but they all look different. Here's what a male usually looks like, this kind of greenish yellow color all over. Here we have a female green finch, which looks a lot different with colors, right? This one looks a lot more brown with just a little bit of yellow. And then a juvenile looks even different than either of these two. So this kind of teenager young bird has really dark brown feathers and just a little bit of yellow. So it might look a little bit different than the bird that you saw, depending on the time of year and if it's the spring or the summer or the winter, or if you're looking possibly at a male or a female or a boy or girl bird. So it can, sometimes can kind of depend. Here are some ideas for making a bird feeder. This is really helpful, especially in the winter, if you have somewhere where you can hang up a bird feeder. So you can bring the birds to you by making this simple bird feeder. If you hang a bird feeder near a window, you can study birds up close without scaring them. Ask an adult to help you. So here, you can actually make this out of a half gallon cardboard milk or juice carton. So just with stuff that you might already have. So some. Uh, sturdy string and wire, some scissors, something sharp for poking a hole like a large nail, and then also some seeds. There are lots of different kind of bird feeds that you can find for birds. So if you draw a square on one side of the carton, about two inches from the bottom of the carton, then you can cut along the sides of the square. So you can just kind of cut a little square in that egg, or that, um, not egg carton, uh, the milk carton or juice carton. Then if you cut across the middle of it, you can make two flaps and fold them over. So you can do this on both sides of the carton so that you end up with kind of two big openings. If you reach inside and kind of poke a few holes in the bottom, that way you don't end up with any water sitting in the bottom of this carton. That way you don't get kind of moldy, gross seeds. You can use some string to hang up the carton after and put some seeds inside and you end up with a nice little bird feeder that you can hang up outside on a nice tree or near a bush. That way you can put some nice seeds in there that birds like to eat. That way you can see birds up close because they're living really close near you. So here you can see two small birds hanging, up, hanging out outside eating seeds out of this little egg carton. A note about feeding birds. Be careful about what foods you put in your bird feeder. Salty foods are harmful to birds and should never be left for them. Sunflower seeds, millet, and thistle seeds are good. Many birds also like to eat suet, which is a hard animal fat. So sometimes you can either make or you can find suet that you can put out for them. So your picture of some sunflower seeds, and this is a pine cone that has had suet rubbed all over it. So a nice, really nutritious meal for those birds, especially in the winter when they really need a lot of energy to keep themselves warm. Be very helpful. Here's also a note that I really enjoy, which is joining a bird count. With practice, you'll soon become an expert bird watcher. Something else may happen as well. Most bird watchers come to appreciate birds deeply. Some even help scientists who study bird populations. Several organizations hold yearly bird counts. These events involve thousands of people across the country and around the world. They work in groups to count the total number of birds they see in a specific area on a single day. The counts are combined and fed into computers. Scientists can then tell which bird populations grow or decline from year to year. If you'd like to join a bird count, you can visit uh, the website on this page. So this one actually is for the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, which has some great resources for bird counts. I will also say another favorite of mine is if you're practicing your bird watching is eBird, uh, which is a really simple, I think it's just eBird.org, where you can both find some great resources for finding where birds are living, but you can also put in when you see a bird. So if you go outside and you see a blue jay outside where you live, you can write it down. So you can enter it into the computer and say, oh, I found a blue jay at this day, at this time, in this place 
and that can help scientists figure out what's going on with blue jays. This works for a lot of other birds as well. So there's lots of great information. So eBird is another great tool and resource where you can actually help scientists, which is fantastic. It's lots of different places. Here is a kind of glossary of some more of the kind of terms that we said, just to make sure that we all remember them. So if you aren't familiar with binoculars, they're a tool that magnifies objects at a distance. When we say calls, when we're talking about birds, we're talking about sounds that a bird makes to communicate with other birds. Sometimes we'll also call this a bird song, but sometimes the noises that they make are kind of short or kind of sharp noises that aren't really sound, that don't really sound like songs, more of calls. A field guide is a reference book, or now a lot of online references, that help you identify things found in nature. When we say field markings, what we mean are the color, marks, or feather patterns on a bird that distinguish it from other birds. Helps you tell them apart. A flock is a group of birds that lives, eats, and travels together. Habitats are places where plants and animals naturally live. A juvenile is a young, immature animal, so kind of a teenager. Uh, to magnify something means to make it look larger. So we use binoculars to magnify uh, when we're looking at a bird. When something migrates, it moves from one place to live in another. A plumage, or the plumage, are the feathers on a bird. Preening that you might see are when birds smooth and arrange their feathers. Range maps are maps that show an area where an animal can be found at different times of the year. And when we say species, we mean one specific kind of plant or animal. So to use our American kestrel here as an example, this is a bird that, <laughs> I'm not trying to take your mouse, I promise. So if you take a look at her, she has some co a couple of really important field markings. So if I was looking at this bird outside, maybe through a pair of binoculars, or maybe she was sitting up in a tree or in a tree branch that I was looking at, there are a few things I would want to look at to identify what kind of bird this was. I would want to look at her beak and her feet, if I could see them very well. I could see that her beak is curved and sharp. I could see that she has bright yellow feet with those scales on them. And if I saw her eating food up in a tree, I could see that she was holding onto it with her feet and that she was eating another animal. So she has big, strong feet with talons on them to be able to grab onto her food. So she's hunting with her feet. And right away, that would help me figure out that this bird is a raptor or a bird who hunts other animals using her feet. So I could tell just by looking at her curved, sharp beak and her feet with those strong feet and talons. So that would be helpful for identifying her. Then I would look at the size. It's a pretty small bird for a raptor. I would also look for some very special field markings. For falcons, I like to look at the dark stripes under their eyes. I think they're very helpful. Usually you don't see those on a lot of other birds, but you see them a lot with falcons. So you see these dark stripes under their eyes to help them see during the middle of the day when it's really bright and sunny out. Right now I have to squint my eyes to look around because it's so bright. It can kind of hurt my eyes, so I have to squint. But this bird, she has dark patches underneath her eyes that help to absorb the glare from the sun. So it's not bouncing off of her cheeks and going into her eyes like it is with me. So she has these kind of built-in sunglasses with the dark patches under her eyes. So that might help me figure out that she's a falcon we're gonna hang it on the grass. <laughs> Can I help pick you up? We'll see if she wants to move around here. A big um, truck went by just right off of, uh, right off the road over here. So I'll give her a second and see if she'll just kind of jump back up before I try to move the camera around. Cause that's kind of shaky. Some other things that I like to look at at birds too, are if you look at their wing shape and their tail shape, falcons usually have the very long pointy wings see if I can help you out. Can I help pick you up? I'm gonna come back up here. Can you stand up here. So you can see the long pointy wings. I'm just gonna hang out on my glove here. So you can see she has these very long pointy wings and she also has a very long narrow tail. 
You wanna just step onto the perch there? We'll just hang out here. So she has the very long pointy wings um, and then the very long narrow tail. Right now her tail is still growing back in after molting all summer long. She's replacing those feathers. So that might make things tricky too. Um, I might also then look, if I can see the colors really well, I might look at the colors that she has. So she has these kind of brown and black stripes on her wings, which I can tell or if I have a field guide or an online guide, you can see that shows us that she is probably a female bird. That's usually when you tend to see those brown and black stripes. And you can also see um, that they have the um, kind of stripes on their chest and belly. So you can be able to look at those and figure those out. So those are some kind of of those field markings that I would look at if I was looking at this American kestrel. I'm going to scroll back through and make sure I didn't miss anything. A kind of a longer book today, but I wanted to talk a little bit about bird watching. Since I've been talking about it so much, I wanted to make sure that other people knew how to go out and look at birds as well. I don't think I had any other questions for today. So we'll finish off here while she kind of starts to maybe work on her mouse a little bit. But this has been uh, an American kestrel that we call Darner, working on this mouse a little bit. Normally you can find them living in big open grassy areas looking for other birds, dragonflies, grasshoppers, other big insects, and small mammals like mice. So hopefully you enjoyed learning a little bit about bird watching with me today. Like I said, the allaboutbirds.org is a great website for finding out more information about how to identify lots of different birds. If you want to learn more about raptors specifically and how to look for them, you can check out our website at theraptorcenter.org. Keep an eye here on this Facebook page and our Instagram account as well. Look for more information and pictures and videos of the birds that we have living here with us. With that in mind, hopefully everyone can get out to safely enjoy some bird watching over the next week um, while we're still kind of in peak migration season with lots of birds passing through. So hopefully folks get a chance to safely get outside and enjoy that. Otherwise, everyone have a great rest of your week and we'll see you next week for more Reading with Raptors. Have a good day, everyone.